Lori, can you hear me? I got you. Sorry, I think you were on mute. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, we are ready to move on with the next interview. Chairman Williams is delayed for a, a few minutes, uh, so we, he will join us shortly, but in the interest of time, um, not making anybody wait, we'll get started. All right, um, General Talley is joining as we speak, so he'll be with us momentarily. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We wanted to make sure you guys were back before we got him to join in. So just give us a second here. Of course, that's, that's fine. <clears throat> There's never a Zoom meeting without glitches. <laughs> well, we didn't, we just wanted to make sure that General uh, Tally wasn't sitting there waiting. So, um, but here he comes now. General Tally, thank you for joining us. General Tally, I think you're on mute. Yes, sir. There we go. Yeah. Yes. General Tali, thank you so much for joining us. This is Gabriela Gonzalez. Chairman Williams will join us um, later. Uh, thank you again for um, uh, coming for your interest in this important position and for uh, making the time to talk with us. I'll get started with the first question. Please give us a five minute overview of how your experience has prepared you for to be president of LSU. Well, good afternoon. I'd like to begin by thanking the search committee for the opportunity to share with you why I believe I'm the right leader to be the next president of LSU. In my view, the president of LSU needs to be a leader who can bridge academia, business, and government. I believe that I am that leader. I have that background. First and foremost, faculty expect their president to be an academic. I'm an academic. I have a PhD in civil and environmental engineering from Carnegie Mellon University. And my dissertation won Best Research Project of the Year as recognized by the Strategic Environmental Research Development Program, which was a joint Department of Defense, Department of Energy, and EPA effort. Since receiving my PhD, I've been in a variety of assignments in academia for over to about 20 years, beginning first with an assistant tenure-track position at the University of Notre Dame in the Department of Civil Engineering and Geological Sciences, and there, while at Notre Dame, I was promoted to early to associate professor with tenure. From Notre Dame, I went to Southern Methodist University, where I was a department chair, I was an institute director, I had an endowed chair, and I was a full professor. Predominantly in the College of Engineering, and particularly the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, but also in global entrepreneurship. After Southern Methodist, I went over and accepted an appointment at the Johns Hopkins University as an adjunct professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Engineering, where I specialized in environmental engineering and science. Following Johns Hopkins, a few years later, I accepted an advanced leadership initiative fellowship and scholar in residence at Cabot House, which was at Harvard University. And my last academic posting was at the University of Southern California, where I held a professor of the practice appointment with appointments in the Price School of Public Policy, the Viterbi School of Engineering, and the Marshall School of Business. I'm an academic and I understand the challenges, but also the joys of being a professor and a researcher. Secondly, 
Donors and benefactors, I believe, expect the president to understand business. I'm a businessman. I have small business experience as well as senior leadership experience at some of the largest corporate companies. My first business experience was as a officer with Malcolm Perney. At that time, the largest privately owned architect engineering firm specializing in water and environmental remediation. Following that, I formed my own companies called Environmental Technology Solutions with a classmate from Oxford. That parent company had five companies under it. They were all based around technologies in energy, agriculture, and the environment based upon what I and others as principal investigators had developed. In fact, Green & Grow, one of our companies, which is an agricultural company, won and competed out of 100 companies at the Oxford Global Business Competition, and we won that competition. Following my time at ETS, I eventually accepted and became a very senior leader at IBM. At IBM, I was the vice president for the public sector globally, worldwide, and also had a dual appointment as a global fellow in their business think tank called the Center for the Business of Government. Following IBM, I founded my own company focused on public-private partnerships, where at the P3I group, we bring together academics, business leaders, and government leaders around technology to solve complex problems. I understand business. Thirdly, I think the LSU president must have and work closely with local, state, and national government. I'm a public servant. Most of my career has, in fact, been in the public servant arena, predominantly armed forces, but also early on as a civil servant in the Corps of Engineers. My last military assignment, I was a three-star general in the U.S. Army and appointed by the president to a four-year term as the 32nd chief of the Army Reserve and commanding general of Army Reserve Command. Now, this is a unique position. There's no other general officer position in the Army like this because you're a component chief reporting to the chief of staff of the Army and the secretary of the Army and having the responsibilities of reporting to the Congress. But also you're the commanding general of all reserve forces worldwide. And for those that may not be familiar, all of your technical enablers in the Army are predominantly in the Army Reserve. So for good or for bad, I would argue for good, almost all your attorneys and legal units are in the Army Reserve, almost all your medical people, engineers, so on and so forth. Now, the reason I highlight the car in the CG role is it's two positions, but one person, similar to this president of LSU system and the president of Baton Rouge, although the car and CG is at a much larger scale. I believe the LSU president should be one position and with the right leader surrounded with the right staff and support and sharing that leadership with others, you can clearly do that job. So how was I able to do all these things? Easy, citizen soldier. What does that mean? That means I had the benefit of being a soldier in the Army Reserve most of my career, and then I would mobilize and deploy when the nation needed me. But when I wasn't mobilized and deployed, I had the benefit of pursuing an academic and business career. Another important aspect, I think, is the president of LSU needs to have love and passion for LSU and Louisiana. I'm an LSU graduate, and I'm married into a Louisiana family. My wife's from Mandeville. She's a Mandeville skipper. She went to LSU. We met at LSU. Our first kiss was under Memorial Tower at, at LSU, which was the tradition then. I'm not sure if it still is. If it isn't, maybe it'll start up again. And then we were married on campus. But despite my direct relationship to LSU and my wife's and marrying into a Louisiana family, which has de facto made Louisiana my second home for 40 years, more importantly, I understand the unique relationship between Louisiana and LSU. My view, how goes LSU? How goes Louisiana? LSU is doing well and is strong. I think Louisiana does in a similar fashion. But despite LSU's unique relationship as the flagship school in Louisiana and its special responsibility there, it has the ability as a national university to have significant national and I would argue global impact. Finally, why do I wanna be the next president of LSU? It's really quite simple. I wanna give back to the school in the state that's given so much to me. I wanna come home. And I want this to be my last professional assignment, not a stepping stone to something else. I started at LSU and I want to finish at LSU. Thank you. Thank you. And a very related question. What's your vision for LSU as an eight institution system, including the LSU Ag Center and Health Centers? Please describe short and long-term goals and metrics to measure your success. 
Well, the first thing I would like to do is say, let's look at how we can expand LSU's culture of winning in sports to a culture of winning in teaching and research, service, and community outreach. Winning on the field and off, it can be done. I would update and expand LSU's strategic plan so it emphasizes land, sea, and space grant university status. There's only about 17 of the universities like that in the United States. While highlighting the unique capabilities of all the campuses, Baton Rouge, Alexandria, Eunice, and Shreveport, our two health, center, health science centers, New Orleans and Shreveport, and the Pennington Biomedical Research Center. The current strategic plan is a good start, but it, it doesn't quite go far enough, and it seems to be predominantly Baton Rouge-centric. Universities can't afford to have redundancy, so what we have to do is make sure that there's one LSU and all the various components fit together to really make us competitive as a national university. Now, with respect to metrics, I could think of lots of metrics that I would be interested in, and I think uh, the faculty would be interested in, and our alumnus, but I'd like to see LSU ranked in the top 100 national universities. Currently, we're ranked 153rd. And I'd like us to be in the top 50 public universities. Currently, we're ranked 72nd. I'd like both of those metrics to be occurred within five years. I'd also like to see LSU's graduation rate increase from 67 to 85% within the next five to seven years. That's gonna be hard. Why 85%? That gives us about a 3% uh, margin over Tulane who I think is around 81, 82%. And finally, I'd like to increase LSU's endowed professorships from where I think they're about 253 to about 300 within five to seven years. I know what that entails. I know how much money that involves raising, but endowed professorships are a great way to attract and retain scholars and will really accelerate us as we move forward in the rankings as a national university. Thank you. Mr. Nelson. Yeah, good afternoon. Can you please describe your leadership style with emphasis on hiring, delegation, and decision making, sir? Yes, sir. Sure will. So I think leadership's about competence, commitment, and character. And the most important of these is character. What often gets senior leaders in trouble throughout, regardless of what sector you're in, is hubris. So I'm always on the guard for myself and others not to be guilty of hubris. My leadership style is open and collaborative. I'm a good listener. I'm also a good teammate. I can lead. I also can follow. I believe in what we call big tent versus small tent, kind of an army term. Big tent means everybody's invited under the tent. Everyone's got ideas and interests. Even the most junior person sometimes can have the most profound and best recommendation. So I focus on a big tent mentality versus a small group mentality. Soft versus hard power is another important principle. I was often sometimes criticized as a general because I was focusing on soft power as opposed to being more directive in nature. That's because I believe soft power is so much more effective. Anybody that's in a significant relationship with another person can attest to the importance and the power of soft versus hard power. I empower and resource others, and then I get out of their way. But perhaps the most important principle of leadership that I've applied that's really been beneficial to me and the organizations I've had the privilege to serve is I surround myself with people that do not look like me, they don't talk like me, they don't have the same background as me, and who will tell me what they think and not what I might want to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Joe, please. You have seen LSU Title IX issues in too many headlines. How do we make protection of students, faculty, and staff from sexual harassment, discrimination, and assault a hard line priority for all institutions of the LSU system? I have seen the Title IX headlines and I've been sickened by them, but in sad and difficult times, I think it's important to remain optimistic about the future. LSU has an opportunity to be a real leader here and, the LSU, and LSU's new president is gonna to need to lead that charge. I think the first responsibility of a university president is to provide a safe environment for its students, staff, and faculty. If selected as your next president, this will be my highest priority. I do believe the recommendations offered in the recent Title IX reviews are a good start, but I'm not convinced they go far enough. I see the real issue as a culture problem. The culture of organizations drive its behavior, which in turn determines its habits. 
Everyone at LSU has to believe and accept that sexual harassment, sexual assault, drug and alcohol abuse, or any type of disrespect will not be tolerated. Holding people accountable is the key here. When I was the chief of the Army Reserve, one that we had a challenge in the, in the Army as an institution of sexual assaults and sexual harassment. It was a major problem. All the services did. I worked very closely with all levels of leadership of the Army and testified on this topic multiple times before the US Congress. The way that we found success and we were able to have success is it can't be pushed from the top down. That certainly has to happen, but it's gotta be pushed from the bottom up. So one of the things we created was a not in my squad campaign. This is young men and women, 17, 18 years of old, same, about the same age as our undergraduates for the most part. And they had to come forward and tell their stories about how they won't accept sexual assault and sexual harassment in their formations, in their organizations. It was remarkably effective. And so I think at LSU, one of the ways to change that culture is it's gotta go from the top and the bottom. But again, I would say from the bottom and from the students themselves, that's how you're gonna have the best success. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Barrios? Yes, hi, good afternoon. How would you ensure that LSU campuses remain student-centered? Please describe how you interact with and engage students, specifically in the area of fostering student success. How do you incorporate student input and respond to their needs and concerns? So I think the best universities are those that put students first. Early in my Army career, we had a saying, soldiers are our credentials. As a professor and research, researcher, I've always believed that students are our credentials. They're our most important stakeholders. Without students, nothing else really matters. I believe, in fact, students make the best ambassadors for the university. Every effort needs to be made to include and invite students to open dialogue and discussion in every form possible. Today, this is easier than ever before with social communication platforms. However, nothing can ever replace face-to-face -face interactions. As part of my strategic communication strategy, I promise to have weekly formal and informal engagements with students. Both in my roles in corporate America and academia, as well as the Army, I always specifically thought about how do I engage stakeholders on a weekly basis? both formally, that is putting things on the calendar and making sure they happen, but also informally. I'll continue to do that, particularly focused on, again, the most important stakeholder at the university, which are students. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mitchell. Good afternoon. Tell us how you would approach leading and working with faculty. What are your views of faculty on faculty governance? Please describe your previous experience in leading, supporting, and uh, growing research and scholarly activities. So a university is only as good as the faculty it can attract and retain. And this means helping them find resources for their work and minimizing barriers that distract them from reaching their professional goals. This is accomplished in my view through faculty governance. I've served on numerous committees, panels, and task force at the department, college, and university level. I've served on the faculty senate I see my leadership role more as a colleague and a peer working through respective chancellors and provosts, deans and department chairs. For the record, department chair, I think is the most difficult uh, leadership place assignment in the university. Having been a department chair, it is a very difficult assignment because as I know all of you know very well, you have all this administration responsibilities, but you're still engaged in teaching and research to the most part. With respect to research and scholarly activities, I have a very strong record in externally funded research. I love research and I get excited about the basic and applied activities that come with it. I have lots of ideas here, but the one that I'll mention now is my belief that the most and best innovative work comes at the fringe between different disciplines. So to facilitate interdisciplinary work or advance novel work not yet reflected in requests for proposals that we might see from sponsors or grant institutions, I'd create a research fund in the Office of Research and Economic Development to be used for startups and or for leverage. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Clark. Thank you. General Talley, in a time of limited and even shrinking resources, budgeting and resource allocations are important responsibilities. 
Budget cuts to higher education have resulted in many unfilled faculty and staff positions, lagging salaries, fewer graduate students, and higher tuition and overhead fees. How can the LSU system begin to address some of these inequities over the next five years without assuming higher budgets? Well, the short answer is by setting priorities with a strategic plan that really lays out the grand challenges. Or maybe put another way, what do we really want to be famous for? Hint, the answer is not just football. Although like all of you, I'd like to see another cha national championship. But a university cannot and should not be all things to all people. We have to determine where we compete, can compete and win. The president will need to lead this effort. However, setting more rigorous and focused priorities is not the standalone solution. We simply will not be able to advance LSU without more resources. Like all of you, I've worked in organizations that say do more with less. It doesn't work. You do less with less. So we simply cannot accept unfilled faculty and staff positions, non-competitive salaries, aging and inferior equipment and facilities. You fund what is important to you. I'll have a lot more to say about this during that fundraising question later on. Thank you. Thank you for your concise answers. <laughs> We we'll have plenty of time for, um, uh, for you to ask questions later. Um, Ms. Jones? Please discuss your commitment to an experience enhancing diversity, including diversity as it relates to underrepresented groups, as well as diversity of thought, experience, et cetera. So I think of diversity as the mixing of people, cultures, and ideas. And I see equity as a combination of opportunity and fairness. I believe inclusion is ensuring everybody's invited and welcomed. A commitment to DEI is simply a must. If we as leaders do not personally embrace or promote DEI, the organization will fail. I'm completely committed to ensuring LSU is a leader in this area. I have a very strong personal history as a leader in promoting change as it relates to underrepresented groups. One example I'll use again is as the chief of the Army Reserve, I looked across the, the organization, I had 134 generals reporting to me, and I said, hmm, does the senior leadership, the more important positions, at least at the top, do they reflect the demographics of our organization? The short answer is they didn't. It's predominantly a white male organization. There were some minorities, very uh, few women in those senior leadership positions. So some of the things I looked at was, how can I create more opportunities and how can we pay more attention to making sure that diversity is represented throughout the organization, not just at the bottom, but at the very top. So I appointed the first female command chief in the history of the Army Reserve. She was absolutely stellar. The first Hispanic chief of staff in the Army Reserve history. My command sergeant major, who was my right hand person was an African-American. I looked particularly at commanding general positions at the one and two star level. And I put more women in commanding general roles than in the history of the Army Reserve. And then I said, the most important thing of leaders is to grow other leaders. So how do we look at the bench and give opportunities, paying attention to diversity so they can compete and win later in their careers? A great success story there was, there was a young general by the name of Jody Daniels. Jody was a one star. I wanted to make sure she had, I could see her one day as perhaps the next chief of the Army Reserve and commanding general Army Reserve Command. Gave her some unique joint opportunities, exposed her to some right opportunities. Later on, lo and behold, she was and currently is the first female chief of the Army Reserve and commanding general of the Army Reserve in history. And so I'm fully committed to diversity. It makes the organizations better and every leader has to get on and focused on DEI. It's critically important. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, General. The next question will uh, come from Ms. Christelle Slaughter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, General. COVID-19 has dramatically impacted campus life and daily life. What are your thoughts for the fall semester of 2021 and beyond? for extended or new COVID protocols? Well, there's no doubt about it. COVID has robbed our society of life and liberty and college campuses have been no exception. Some universities have even predicted it could take five to 10 years to fully recover from the negative impacts of the pandemic. 
Yet things are looking more positive now than ever before. Notwithstanding some unforeseen developments, I believe the fall semester should return to full-time on-campus classes and activities. Of course, there will be a new normal based upon federal, state, and local guidance. The good news is that LSU has two health science centers that can work collectively with the administration to protect the safety of our most precious asset, and that's our people. With respect to extended or new COVID protocols, new technologies to monitor advice responses are being widely developed and utilized. While I was at IBM, I led with the help of others, the development and implementation of IBM's disaster emergency management system, I named it IDEMS, which focused on COVID response utilizing predictive analysis management tools. With proper leadership and planning, LSU should be able to mitigate risk and allow students, staff, and faculty to return to campus. Thank you. Perfect, uh, Dr. Lester Wayne Johnson with the next question, please. Good afternoon, General Talley, and thank you very much for your service. Uh, if you would uh, discuss your fundraising experience and thoughts on additional revenue generation opportunities. And if you would, please give us some demonstrated examples. Yes, sir, I'll spend a little more time on this one. Um, next to providing a safe environment for learning and working, I believe fundraising is the second most important function of a university president. Fundraising should take a significant amount of time and energy. And if it's done right, I believe it'll strengthen alumni ties I've had to fight and scrap for money in every position I've ever had. To be candid, I'm good at it. In academia, I've supported successful team efforts at the department, college, and university level with respect to gift giving. This included the creation of scholarship funds for women engineers and scientists, research initiatives, laboratory facility enhancements, and named faculty positions. In my role at IBM, I was directly responsible for bringing in hundreds of millions of dollars in business development each year. And as the chief of the Army Reserve, I prepared and defended before the Army staff, the Department of Defense, and the U.S. Congress an annual operating budget of $9 billion. Now, for those who think getting a government budget through the Pentagon is easy, I can only tell you that the battle scars are serious, and there's no Purple Hearts awarded. It's absolutely vicious. But simply put, the president of the university has to be exceptionally strong at developing relationships and partnerships that can generate significant financial resources. You simply can never have enough resources. That's not to say that the president should chase after every opportunity and dollar, but you gotta be willing to go the extra mile to close the deal. I consider this to be one of my strengths. I'm very good at finding legal and ethical ways to partner with individuals and organizations that provide financial benefits to the organizations I serve. But how do you generate additional revenue for LSU? The standalone solution can't be to raise tuition and get more money from the state, although I would welcome more money from the state. Although I do not have the specific details on, on where LSU makes and loses money, I do know what seems to have worked at other universities I've served at. Now, although this is an oversimplification, so I hope you'll forgive me, my experience at most universities is that they break even on undergraduates generally via tuition, if they're lucky. They attempt to pay graduate students out of research grants, and then they make money in executive education and programs. Another way to generate revenue is to create entrepreneurship parks that provide revenue streaming from licensing issued on university-owned IP and other activities. This has been a very successful business model for some national universities. But the big dollars often come in the form of gifts from private or corporate benefactors. Working with our alumni association and our foundations, and our generous LSU family and friends, I know I can have significant impact in this area. Thank you. Next question is, uh, immediate past chair of the Board of Supervisors, Mary Werner. Good afternoon, General. Thank you for joining us today. What is your vision for the success of LSU athletics and its role in the holistic development of student athletes? Schools that have successful sports programs often see a significant increase in gift giving, applications from prospective students, and involvement from alumni. The active holistic development of student athletes, to use a military term, can be a force multiplier for good for the entire university. And it helps build that overall LSU winning culture I mentioned at the beginning of this interview. 
student athletics should be integrated as much as possible with the school population as a whole, where they can serve as role models where appropriate. I think sports and education are two great ways to provide opportunities to those who otherwise may have less choices in life due to a disadvantaged background. Successful LSU athletics benefit everyone as long as the basic norms of accountability are maintained. Thank you. Okay. With the remaining 45 minutes, <laughs> what questions do you have for us as a committee? I'm going to guarantee you we're not going to do this for 45 minutes, but, <laughs> but uh, please take, we have some time. Do you have any questions for us? Well, thank you, Mr. Williams. I, well, I could ask some pretty tough questions. It might take that long, but, but uh, I try, I pride myself on trying to be organized and succinct. Uh, but I think the first question I would have was how, so this is just, you know, however you want to answer it collectively, how would you rate LSU's diversity among the faculty, staff, and senior leaders? Do you know or believe that the demographics rep, that they in fact resemble the demographics of the student population? Uh, I have been doing this thing where I would uh, punt this over to faculty and other community members, but this is an issue I'm, I have an interest in, so I will start and simply say that it is unacceptable. And I will allow anyone else to expand on that. But it is unacceptable. It is not where it should be. I can, um, I can tell as a faculty member that uh, I am not from Louisiana. I am from Argentina. <laughs> Uh, but I can see the, the students and I can see, I, I teach large introductory courses often in, in physics, and I can see the students looking for mentors and looking for role models and not seeing in their professors people that look like them, and that hurts us. Yeah, I agree with you, Professor Gonzalez. I think, especially this past year, it's really been, um, I, I've made, I've noticed it more than ever, I think, a lot of our students of color do not have faculty that looks like them or they can relate to. And so I think, it, I think that's a real issue on our campus and one that we need to address. Um, yeah, I, I found, you know, just reflecting on my past four years here as a student, I have not barely had any faculty of color and the times that I've had, they've been so wonderful. And I, I feel like I've gained a completely new perspective. So I think it's, it needs a lot of improvement. I really do think that. I can reflect as uh, a person who started as an instructor and has worked up to the dean's level um, that we have significant work to do. That being said, uh, we've done, uh, we've increased our overall enrollment and that's one of the stories that we've regularly told. But as we've increased our student enrollment, not only do we need more faculty, but we need faculty that are more representative of the student demographic that we've attracted. Um, I think there's been success and we've told that story, but as you, as you were describing with hubris, as you tell the story of success at the student level, it has to be reflected at the faculty, staff, and upper, upper level administrative level as well. So we have work to do. All right, I don't, uh, I don't see any other hands. Do you have any other questions you'd like to pose to the committee? Uh, yes, Mr. Williams. What do you see as the single biggest concern or challenge for faculty and I recognize that those challenges could be different depending on what center or campus those faculty are located at. I'd encourage a member of the faculty to, to uh, start with answer. Yeah, let's Dr. And Nelson. So I think regardless, I'm Steve Nelson, I'm the Dean of the School of Medicine in New Orleans. Good afternoon. I think regardless of the area of focus, whether it's ag or humanities or medical science, I think it's access to resources. Um, you know, I think it's no mystery over the past uh, 10 years, the budget has been severely uh, cut. And while many states have been able to start to reinvest in higher education, uh, the current administration certainly has helped stop the decline and actually start to put more resources in. But regardless of whatever your aspirational goal is, whether it's NCI designation or 
being a poet laureate or whatever it happens to be, you have to have access to resources. Resources helps you attract the stellar faculty, helps you build the infrastructure that you need to succeed. So I would say a unifying point would be resources. I think the other thing that we need to do a little bit better is learn how to work with each other. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. You know, I always joke if you have uh, three intensive care doctors like me, a lung doctor looking at an x-ray, we're probably all going to come up with the same diagnosis or the same list of diagnoses. But if you have an infectious disease doctor or rheumatologist, they're going to say there's something different. So I think the ability to, for us to work together uh, is really critical to our success. Several years ago, we started a, a, a proposal, a research fund, where the School of Medicine put up $250,000. And then we asked the other colleges here at the main campus to each put up whatever they thought they could. The average was about $50,000 and to create a pool of money that we could compete for intramurally. And so the only requirement was that a faculty from the School of Medicine would have to work with a faculty member at the main campus. So it led to lots of creative ideas. We had uh, infectious disease doctors working with the chemists here to design new formulations of antibiotics that would be more effective. We had psychiatrists working with computer people here because the way you treat PTSD is by deconditioning, by working through that same sort of uh, condition or episode that led to that. So in terms of virtual um, uh, sort of feature uh, applications. So getting different people together, like you said, I think also speaks to why we need to improve our diversity. I will say that I think as a system, we've been more effective, certainly in the School of Medicine. Now we've been able to be, become more diverse. Do we reflect the population of New Orleans? I would say no, but when you look at our numbers compared to other state universities that have medical schools, we're doing better. And I think we're all cognizant of this and trying to do better. That, that, so yes, let me uh, just jump in. That, that, that's great because what it tells me is the, the health science centers have already de facto pursued and had great success in the approach that I recommended. Of course, the key is we got to get that across all of LSU. But anyway, thank you, doctor. Well, you know, everybody talks about taking down silos, but taking down silos leaves you in the same place. I talk about building bridges, right? Taking I mean, down the building. I'm an engineer. I like that analogy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And, and uh, Chancellor uh, Larry Clark, I think, had a, a, either a question or a follow up. I do have a follow up. <clears throat> I do agree that uh, the access to resources and working with each other is great. And I think we have examples at LSU Shreveport where we have done that within the LSU entity. One of the challenges I think that many of the LSU entity, I think I, I would have to say all have, is that we have two level of two types of <laughs> two groups of faculty. We have those who have been with us a long time and at LSU Shreveport used by example, uh, those faculty who have been at LSU say since 2000 have had one permanent pay raise since 2008. That's it. And we're hiring faculty, we've grown. We were at 4,000 students in 2014. We're now nearly 10,000 students. That's required us to hire a lot of new faculty and staff. We've hired them at market. And you can understand that the challenge is that we have those who are the foundation stones of LSU Shreveport of the faculty currently are paid far less than the faculty we've had to hire because of those no pay raises. And so I think that's, we can talk about opportunity. We created uh, new levels of resources for grants for faculty and support for faculty. We've done all of that. There's still some basic fundamental things that either the state has to take up and, and seriously consider or have to be worked out. The last two years, we've had money to self-fund pay raises, but could not do pay raises. So it's, it's a challenge. And I think that'd be something that the new president has to deal with. That's uh, true at, at all the RNPs. Yeah, that, that's a horrible scenario. And I, it, it breaks my heart to see, to be frank, uh, the senior experienced faculty members. I understand you, you, know, you have to compete with market to bring the, the young talent in, but how horrible is that, that we can't financially- Excellent acknowledge. I mean, it's just, it's a horrible scenario. I agree. That's going to have to be fixed. Perfect. Okay. Uh, General, we'll have time for, to entertain one more question from you. I, I guess that my last question would be, 
when we look across all the campuses and, and the centers, I kind of heard some of this from some of the earlier answers, but do we see LSU as one LSU from your perspective or, or is it, or is the perception, no, we're really different LSUs and different, so to speak, centers within the university system. And if that's the case, which is kind of what I'm picking up on, um, are there any practical suggestions that anybody on the search committee might have for the next president as how, however, he or she could bring that group together? Hi, I'll, General. I can, I can address that. Uh, Jessica Jones, I'm at the two-year campus from LSU Eunice. And so I started there in 2018. And so a part of the consensus was that there was a disconnect between the main campus and some of the other what we call connected campuses. It's very recently um, under Dr. Gallagher's leadership that a lot of individuals at my institution are saying that we are feeling that we're a part of the one LSU, not just theoretically, but also in practice uh, with the sharing of resources, um, as well as, uh, you know, even with understanding uh, administration and the transparency and that type of collaboration. So I think moving forward, that would need to continue to where we're, we're definitely collaborating more in thought with resources to where we're feeling that we're all moving towards the same direction. So I think we're definitely on the, um, on a good, we're at a good start with having that to be the true one LSU. To me, it's sort of like you have eight children. And regardless of whether it was the first or the last, you love them all the same. And so I think it's a matter of recognizing each child or each part of that system has very unique talents and skills that we need to recognize and develop and realize that no one has to be the same and that we should bring out the individual strengths of those institutions and see how they can all work together in harmony. So I think it's definitely possible, but it takes a leader to sort of set that goal. I mean, that's a, that, so thank you both. Those are great answers. I mean, the analogy about being a good parent, how we love all of our kids the same, but we have to recognize each one's unique and different and we need to promote and encourage that difference. That's a great analogy. And, you know, a little inside baseball, back when I was a professor at Notre Dame, I used to be known as the professor of bad analogies. And I took that label with pride because I would use analogies uh, to engineering students to really communicate complicated science and engineering principles, but I'd always give them a bad analogy. They would remember the bad analogy and then it would often help them, particularly on midterms and finals. But anyway, those are two great answers and I appreciate that. I, what I'd like to simply say is in closing, please accept my personal thanks for all you're doing as members of the search committee. And I wish you, your families, and all the other candidates that you're considering, I wish everybody the very best. Go Tigers. Thank you very Thank much. You. This uh, Wildor Williams. There we go. Thank you, General Talley. You can log off now. That would be great. Thanks, Laurie. Bye-bye. Thank you. So uh, it is my understanding, committee members, that we are uh, running ahead of schedule. The next interview begins at two o'clock PM. So this time uh, we will stand. I want to make, do y'all have anything you want to address with us before we recess? No, we're good. All right. At this time, we will stand in recess until uh, 1 55 PM so that we can be in place to begin the next interview at 2 PM. Hey, Ms. Williams. <laughs>